This is Zeiss Presents Full Exposure, the weekly resource for news, trends, and the people who influence the world of photography and cinematography. Hosted by veteran photographer and filmmaker Jim Camp. For over 30 years, award-winning documentary photographer, filmmaker, and journalist Richard Falco has covered the world for major magazines and published books on the September 11th attacks and paramedics in Harlem. He is now the coordinator of multimedia journalism in the Masters of Communication program at Sacred Heart University in Connecticut and the director of the Vision Project, a multifaceted organization dedicated to promoting investigative journalism, photography, multimedia, and education. A vast archive of this important work can be seen and heard at visionproject.org. Rick, thanks for coming in. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's great to be here. You have um, a really cool career as a, oh, I don't know, <laughs> like me. I, I guess we used to call ourselves photojournalists uh, back in the day. Um, and you've sort of, your career has sort of morphed. You I mean, you're now an educator. Uh, you're combining visual storytelling with a project that is doing probably things that there's not a lot of still being done, which is real, you know, real uh, incisive uh, documentary storytelling. Tell us a little about how you arrived there. Well, I think, you know, we have all seen the evolution of the news business. And when I first came to photography, it was really to find a voice, say something, have impact, maybe make change, make awareness. I think as many things have evolved, the internet, the digital world, it forced changes on the business that forced us to think differently about what we do and more importantly how we do it. I mean, you know, before you and I have talked, you know, you were basically a magazine photographer. You worked with Time and Newsweek and, you know, you went out on assignment. Your agency also represented you all around the world. So even if we couldn't get a commitment, you know, they would back it. We saw a great change, particularly after September 11th. Um, and the writing was on the wall. Uh, I didn't see that model working anymore. It was still very important to me to create content that I thought had depth, you know? And I was also getting tired of watching so much of my stuff being taken out of my control. You know, the, the old saying, you know, upon publication, you grieve. Um, <laughs> but I thought, I'm going to give this a shot. Uh, I didn't see any looking back because I didn't see any positive movement in terms of the way things were done and where they were going. And I thought that it was pretty much the end of the line in a matter of years. So I decided to create Vision Project as a not-for-profit organization for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to maintain the integrity and control of the content. And two, I knew that I could apply for foundation support, corporate support, where one could not do that as an individual or even as a commercial entity, thinking that you know I would tap into that and do stories until they were done and use the vehicle of the internet as my distribution center, which worked out very well. Because I think what it is now is people don't look at the traditional hold in your hand magazine. Everything is done online. And it's become our major source of, of getting the stuff out there, I, I think. It increases every year. We have now, I think, between a million and two million people hmm. visiting us yearly. Uh, that's growing. But more importantly, it, it, it's a segment of the population that I think is extremely interested in this kind of content. And we have focused more on making that content available to educational institutions, universities, and the like, um, community organizations because we're very issue oriented. And I think it becomes a benefit uh, to others because of the depth of the way we approach it. It's kind of, not to use the word, I guess it would be, you know, um, advocacy journalism. I don't know how else to express it. It's not just a matter of saying this exists. If you look at our stories, it's we're looking at an issue, a situation, and not just saying this happens, but we're looking at ways that people who come to us <clears throat> can see ways to find resolution, understanding, and clarity to address the problems that they are facing through it. How does a story and a project come to 
vision project? Well, I think, you know, being media savvy and always having my ear open to what's going on, I'm constantly paying attention to what's going on. Uh, though I have some issues with how things are presented, but I'm always looking. It's just a part of, I think, uh, for being a black sloth photographer for so many years and, and, and my whole attitude as to why I do what I do. So you, you become aware and then you're starting to look at how am I going to present this content in a way that could be presented to a public. So when we began Vision Project, it was basically the traditional still image with text, the kind of magazine. And our, our magazine is Witness. We do have an online magazine which follows that kind of traditional method. But I think what happened was is the evolution of the technology and the change forced us to think outside the box and then saw, well, I think what it, we realized is that it was no longer just one, you know, medium, that now it's about video, it's about stills, it's about audio, it's how I put them together, how I can do different things for different audiences in terms of showing what I think they need to see and understand and using that tool to get there. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Black Star. There's a, probably a lot of people listening that don't know what that was. I mean, in, in you know, when we were starting and working uh, a moment years ago, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there were agencies that represented photographers, and That's they would right. represent you to a magazine. And uh, like you said, uh, Black Star was one of them. There were there were many Sigma, Gamma, um, et cetera, Contact, um, and if you couldn't necessarily sell a magazine on a story, an agency would back you if they felt the story was important enough and then get you a guarantee later or, you know, get, yeah. get cut, cover your expenses and all that stuff. That basically went away. And so it seems like what you're doing now is sort of filling this void of, you know, the sort of the, the waning days of magazines. I put it mildly. I mean, it's basically the death of uh, traditional journalism and magazines. So you're providing a, a platform for this kind of storytelling. But uh, is it seen anywhere else other than on the web via your site? Well, I mean, there are different things that we do for different projects. As I said, we have now been tapping into what I think is our most important connection, which is educational institutions. So we have been doing events through um, universities. We work with them on levels where we will bring in and do public forums. We will bring our films there. We will actually set up exhibits for them. And we have a, now a large connection of, of institutions all around the states and not just around the states but throughout Europe and Asia as well that are coming to us for our content and working with us on different levels for different stories. And I think that has been the most significant change in terms of the way we have to do business, because I don't know how else you do it now. I mean, uh, what we saw with the big debacle of our economy, you know, um, where Nikon was a major supporter of, of us for a while, you know, when the economy tanked, we were on our knees. But I had at that point realized the value of educational institutions, and more importantly, I realized that they were very interested in the content. So again, on lots of levels, you know, it, it's plugging into that network and, and figuring out how to make it work for you. As I was telling you, we have these traveling exhibitions, which we charge, I think, a very small amount of money. I think we, we're charging somewhere around $5,000 to bring it to them. And then we would help organize either a viewing with the film, if there was one involved, or a public forum where we'd bring in their community members with specialists on the issue to talk and discuss what's going on. That has been very successful and I think has a value um, that you can't get, even if not just the magazines anymore, but just go watch your, you know, 22 minutes of news. I mean, it's a brief overview of things. Um, nothing is done in terms of investigative journalism anymore. It's a rare thing. I mean, yes, HBO comes up with their things, but I'm wondering how many people actually watch it. Frontline is doing wonderful things. How many people watch it? I don't know. But what I realized is, is where this generation in particular is interested in information, they don't go and buy a magazine. They're doing it online. So unless you use that to tap into that audience, I don't think you're going to get it out there. Um, you know, I tried to tell you we had a thing with one of our films, Josie. Um, 
where, you know, I was shopping it and shopping it and shopping it. It was getting nowhere in terms of it. And then even PBS had like a two-year wait, and maybe they were going to do it, maybe they weren't. I finally released it online, and I told you, within the two-week period, we had over 60,000 people worldwide Hmm. watching that film. And I think, though it's an eye-opener as to how people get their information, you know, I think people are coming to us, particularly researchers, uh, graduate students who are doing it because we have very vetted content. Like I'm not putting out garbage. Everything I do is based on solid foundation, truth, fact finding. And I think that's important in this day and age of the internet where uh, you never know what you're getting out there, you know. And uh, and I think um, as, 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 as the technology <clears throat> continues to move forward and as the generation uses their phone or their computer solely as the means for getting information that that's going to be the major force behind how people you know look for what they want yeah give us just like an overview of uh of vision project as far as what your main tenants are what are your main uh part of your mission uh you know uh the mat you have the magazine witness magazine as you've mentioned well, we're doing a number of things now. Um, if you look at the site, what you're going to see is it's divided <coughs> into segments. We have the magazine witness, which is basically, as I said, the traditional you know image with text. But what I'm doing now is I'm trying to promote lots of different components of media in ways that I think are of value in relationship to our mission. We have a gallery section. I have lots of people who are coming to us who have really great photo stories, may not be well written, but photo stories that are not finding an outlet for it. I'm not only publishing it, I'm promoting them so that that work's getting out there. So it becomes a vehicle for people to see who they are and what they're doing. We have the magazine, which has its, you know, its issues. Now we've moved into also multimedia because I said the technology has changed. Um, I no longer think just still image anymore. I'm thinking like, okay, I can use audio here. I want to use some video. I want to put it together. These are basically three, maybe the 12 minute pieces that combine all of them. They're very issue oriented in content and, and they focus on an issue quite smaller and more precise, like a 60 minutes kind of thing. And then, of course, we've moved to full-blown films where you can watch a complete documentary, which can be anywhere from, you know, half hour to an hour, depending on what it is. Now, what we've seen is that there are different audiences that like to get their information differently, and we're trying to figure out how to tap into those audiences using the vehicle of the media that allows us to to tell the story. You know, we've moved into other things, as you've seen, too, e-books. Because to publish a photo book now is nearly impossible. They're too expensive to produce, and uh, not that many people buy them Limited anymore. Market, yeah. You know, and then we do special projects as well. So we're always looking for ways to delve into something that I think has social value, uh, and 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 then bring it to the public in a manner uh, that they have quality content that they can rely on for fact-finding and truth. Yeah. You mentioned the evolution into film. Um, you uh, brought a, a couple of uh, a clips, a uh, trailer from one in particular that uh, we could take a look at, and then you could just explain the evolution of that, if you would. Now, these are larger content films. I mean, what we have done is we've looked at major issues in particularly the States, and we wanted to see how we can approach that content in a way that explained historically how things have evolved and changed, where we are now, and more importantly, where we're going. So if we look at Dorothea's Tears, it's basically what has happened to mental health care in America. And how we've looked at it is how it's changed from before the 19th century with Dorothea, uh, who actually began this whole concept of institutionalized uh, mental health care, how it grew, developed, and then how the process of decentralizing or deinstitutionalizing um, the care 
changed and evolved. And now the concept was to move it from these large institutions to these smaller community-based things. Well, what happened was what always happens. They decided to close down the institutions, but no one ever built the smaller facilities to accommodate it, and lots of these people are just thrown out into the streets. Yeah, they didn't think of the repercussions. No, and then what's happened is most of them have landed in prison. Okay, but that is also tied to other things that we have going on because the insane gun violence that we see in this country, and we've tied it to what has happened right down the road here. Um, we are all familiar with the tragedy of you know Sandy Hook, but the, you know Fairfield Hill was one of the largest mental institutions in America, is a couple of miles down the road from where Sandy Hook yeah. happened, and we took what um, Fairfield Hill was doing how it evolved, how it changed, how it actually was closed down and the repercussions to the community and then the horrible incident of what happened at this school shooting. And bringing this all together, because that's what I mean, I think, you know, people want things in black and white and I think life is mostly in the gray area. So if you're gonna pick a topic you can't just tell it in a one-dimensional kind of way. I think you need all of the components to make up the various parts of understanding an issue before someone can evaluate it and make decisions about how I address this issue. And that's really how our advocacy journalism moves forward in terms of what we believe we're doing and what we want to do. Hmm. So uh, I'm getting back to just how the genesis of a project, uh, does it, uh, does a, a project occur more or less within your under your umbrella, or do or do people come and pitch projects to you like uh, a magazine? Two two ways, two ways. Obviously, we have an agenda of things we want to do, uh, and, and and the example is that is we do something like Dorothy Estes, and then we'll do a small multimedia piece like on DACA, okay, uh, and and that is usually me or people who are with me are interested in something and decide they want to explore something and it becomes a piece. The other thing that is happening is because we've been around for a while is now people are aware of who we are and are coming to me with content and either looking for publication or help and promotion. And at that stage, we will try to then find a way to help promote it by publishing it or help them maybe financially. That's becoming harder and harder because the sources of revenue keep drying up. Uh, but the magazine is something where a lot of those are people who are doing something that either come to me or I discover that they're focusing on an issue and we start thinking in terms of a magazine outlet. And if you look at those magazines, those are very large stories. Uh, you know, 15, 20 page stories. Mm. And I don't think well, other than maybe geographic, I don't know anyone else that's doing them like mm, that. Mm. And I think the thing is, is it becomes a real collective effort because I work closely with the photographer, videographer, journalist. Uh, when they're not writing it, then I will either bring in a writer or figure out how to connect the two. And it's a long-term process. These don't happen overnight because I will sit and talk about the issue so I understand it. So even when I think of the layout of the magazine, I'm making sure everything is represented there in a way that is clear and, and, and quite in-depth. What's your staff like? My staff is small. My staff is really uh, based on a project-based thing. Now, as, as you probably know, too, we have a, a very direct affiliation with Sacred Heart University, who is now partnered with us many times, and I am now the coordinator for the digital journalism program for the master's program. We have a lot of interns that work with us directly. Um, the last couple of years, I've had some great ones who then not only after they graduated worked with us, you know, full time, and uh, I've tapped into that quite often. And that makes it work very well. One, for us too, but more importantly, it gives these young people an opportunity to work with professionals and really do things on a high level of, of integrity and quality that I think they carry with them for the rest of their career. Do you have master's students working on these projects? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. I've also had undergrads. You know, oh, wow. our, our yeah. film that we did uh, holding back the surge on the rebuilding of the hurricane protection system in New Orleans, I shot that with two undergrads and two grad students. Oh, really? <laughs> but the quality is great. Uh, I mean, and I think the the thing is, is that you have these young people who are interested. They don't have a lot of outlets define the voice and, and, and talk about important social issues, you know. I think too often, particularly here in the States, people are more consumed with 
entertainment rather than information. And I think that that is very detrimental to our democracy. We see the polarization that has evolved in this country, particularly with the news and particularly with cable news, uh, where people don't go any longer to an agency or an organization to get information. They go someplace that's going to advocate what they want to hear. Well, there's just an outright demonization of journalism in general. So um, there's probably something that, uh, it, you know, uh, adds to the credibility of a story by seeing it visually um, than, uh, than, than word journalism, because we know word, word journalism in, in particular is under assault, as well as uh, certain television outlets. Yeah, and I think <coughs> that's important. You know, one of the things I talk about in, in my classes is, is what is the photographer? What is the journalist? He is not just the artist, the photographer. He's a sociologist. He's a historian. He's a psychologist. You know, uh, one thing I bring up in my classes, if I phoned you up and said, you know, two planes just flew into the World Trade Centers, would you believe them? They'd go, no. I said, well, what do we have? We have the visual images. That was the proof. That was the evidence. That was the thing that said this happened. No one can deny it. I mean, to this day, we have people denying the Holocaust. Correct. I was just thinking that. All right. And what do we have? We have these documents that say this happened. Yeah. Look. Yeah. Okay. You know, a, a friend of mine who I think is doing some great work, he, he said that, you know, uh, journalism is the first draft of history. And I honestly think he hit it right on the head. Hmm. It is. Uh, the problem is, is filtering through all the garbage that we see out there and you know the polarization that has been created to even institutions like Fox News which truth has nothing to do with anything they talk about uh, and I hate to point out one over any others because there are issues with all but I mean you know we make our decisions on life by the information we get and 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 unless you can find places that can give you honest information that is in depth that can explore an issue in a way that is more than just, you know, a snapshot or a, a quick overview. You know, too often on news now, you see them running to the fire and sticking the mic under the widow's face. What do you think of your kid's death? I mean, it's so absurd to me to, to cover news like that. So they're chasing fires and not doing investigative journalism, which unfortunately I think is another detrimental component of what's happened here to our society, and it eats away at our democracy. Well, well, we've always heard, though, the if it, if it bleeds, it leads thing in journalism for years and years. You know, the, the, the tragedy is always on the front page and, and so on. Uh, but what do, you, um, what do you hope for in what you're doing for how to see how it evolves to where you are now? Where would you like to see it? How would you like to see it evolve? Uh, that's a great <coughs> question. I th again, there are a lot of components to that. I think when I came to journalism, like I had things that upset me at the time or things that I wanted to talk about and explore. And, and, and the photography at the time gave me that vehicle to do that. You know, it was an excuse to explore, an excuse to have a voice to yell at something or say yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. And, and I still think that those things are important. What I think I'm trying to do now is because of this immediate connection to universities and educational institutions, it allows us to plant seeds to a generation that is going to be the future. Because I think that's where it has to happen. I think what you find is as we get older, we're you know, stuck in our ways or we have our philosophy, our way of thinking, and change is difficult. But I think as the new generation taps into this technology and hopefully uses it outside of Facebook to do something intelligent with it, um, I can have a powerful effect that will shape the way they view their world and thus maybe begin a process of decision making that has social implications. And those those things will allow the individuals or corporations or the lot that is trying to manipulate truth for their own benefit not to be able to get away with it. Because unless people have a place to go to connect that, you know, says something of value to them, you know, we live in this little silo, which I think makes us more isolated in this world. And I think that's one of the tragedies of the Internet. It, 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 you know, it, we can sit in our own room alone and live there and not experience the world and not connect in a way that 
we evolve as human beings in an important emotional and intellectual way. And I think if I can just touch one person, then I'm I'm okay with that. But how do you deal with uh, attention span? I mean, that is you know that is part of the uh, the that is MTV part of the, the equation. <laughs> MTV. I mean, it's not even MTV. It's you right. know it's the sixty second Instagram right. story in quotes. Right. You know, uh, I mean, how do you deal with that in your um, obviously it's not as relevant in a magazine type format, but in a in a film or multimedia format. You know, people are used to getting things in three minutes, and that's considered long form. <laughs> no, no, I agree. I, I, I bring up MTV because I think MTV was the people that forced this whole way of thinking. And right, now it's, can I get it in two minutes on my phone? Again, I think that's why we have different ways in which we show the content, like we have the galleries, which is mm -hmm. just pictures, we mm -hmm. have the magazine, which is a combination of text and photos, we have the multimedia, which is the shorter things, the full-blown film. I can't reach everybody. I can't do everything because one, just getting the funding to do everything I want is nearly impossible most of the time anyway. So I'm gonna pick certain subjects and then try to look at the format. I think we're finding more people are coming to our multimedia than they are to our full-blown films because of that. The attention spans are smaller. You know, in five minutes they can get a lot of information. Our podcasts are a good uh, vehicle for that kind of thing. And we've, we've built them that way so that it not just showcases the work of an individual, but you get inside their head. You understand why they think what drives them. Yeah. So it becomes an educational tool as well. Um, but I can't reach everybody because we have such a diverse community and people want things differently. I mean, there's still people like want to hold a magazine in their hand, you know, Quite honestly, when I'm done working, I do not want to go in front of a computer and read. I'd rather right. pick up a book. Right. That's me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, there's, uh, that's that's a it's a really cool uh, model that you have that to give a little uh, little ass assortment a poo poo platter of uh, of journalism. You know, to however, whatever you're in the mood for consuming. You know. Right, and I think you know the thing is too, is that the technology is dictating. You know. I mean, it's forced me to make decisions editorially right. that I probably would not have made if I didn't have to. Right, right. You know what I mean? Um, but the technology is such as that you, either you're in or you're out. Because if you're out, you're out. No one's going to see it, look at it, touch it. And uh, you have to find a way to do and say what you want in a format that at least can touch someone. You know, again, I think that's why I keep going back to the importance of connecting to educational institutions, because I think those seeds planted at that time in their life can grow into something more powerful and hopefully can change uh, the way a young person thinks or give them new awareness or just make them a different person, even if they ask different questions. Yeah, it's interesting, too, that you mentioned that, you know, uh, when we were talking before we went on that... Um, you know, so much of your viewership comes from Europe and Asia as opposed to here. Mm -hmm. So that must be, I don't know, a little dispiriting in the sense that, you know, you're thinking it, you want to reach a younger audience, yet they're, I mean, traditionally Europe has always been a hungrier for photojournalism even, you know, when we were doing it yep, for absolutely. magazines and stuff, yep. you know, it went all over Europe yep. more so than here as the market was dying here. But how do you hope to reach people here? I know I'm putting you on the spot. but No, you're not because, I mean, this is a dilemma that I think our media <clears throat> and our politicians have forced or created a polarization um, that makes people not want information that is against what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that that's the essential component that I think drives how things are done now. If we look at our elections, why does it cost so much money to have an ele a presidential, a billion dollars, right? I mean, and look at how they work the system mm -hmm. because people are no longer going to, oh, I don't know, ABC, CBS, uh, PBS, you know, they, they're getting it from the internet and what they're doing is they're typing in and then they're finding, you know, sites that 
what source, tell them the what source? they right, right, want right. to hear, not necessarily what they don't want right. to hear, and then only go back to Echo that. Chamber, yeah. So what it does is it creates a tighter, you know, well, I guess, you know, a silo. Mm. I, and, I, and I keep reinforcing it by only getting this information. I think maybe because both Asia and Europe have had a greater history um, they've also had terrible wars fought on their soil. Um, I think also, particularly Asia, they've come to the use of the internet faster and 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 with more desire than Americans did. Americans tend to want to be more entertained, as I said before, than informed. And uh, you know, well, that's they were also they were also very very first to being mobile, uh, even on the African continent. Um, you know, it's becoming a, it's more it's much more of a mobile uh, where you receive your information than just sitting someplace at a desktop. Right. right. Uh, yeah. I mean, and that's also limited how they get their information. So everybody has now these apps that, right. you know, and filters in, everything. Yeah. yeah. In in you know thirty seconds, I've told you about the world. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's I I also joke with my students. You know, like. Now you're going to do research. So that means if it's not on the first two pages of Google, it doesn't exist. No, that means you maybe have to go and dig a little Still deeper. Dig a little deeper. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, in another respect, the internet has made it easy for us that it's made us also lazy. Hmm. You know, because you have to filter quite a bit of the garbage that you see there. I mean, look at what David Duke was doing a little while ago. You know, I mean, the way, uh, you know, these spiders and search engines would do it is they'd read across the metadata and then they would direct you to it. So what you could do is you could implant in the metadata words, ideas that you wanted to do. So David Duke, as we know, is, you know, a white supremacist. So in his website, when he set it up, <clears throat> he had Martin Luther King, civil rights. So you type in civil rights oh. and you would be directed to him. Now, the spiders don't do that anymore because they're looking at more information that needs to be written in there. So the metadata is looked at differently and changed. But then you have Google, which after you start using it for a while, then tries to figure out what you want to look at and will only direct you to things it thinks you want to see. Again, you know, the technology is dictating where we go and what kind of information we get. What, what, are, you, um, what are you most hopeful about when you, in your students and in, in your classes from what you see is along the lines of what you've built with this project? And the kids that you're teaching, do, do, do you have um, do you have a, a, a deep well of uh, of hope for this uh, for this uh, new crop of uh, of storytellers? You know, it, it's funny because you know um, <clears throat> our demographic is different, and I see a broad range. I see from extremely to the right, extremely to the left, to the hippies I'm stoned all the time, to the dedicated student that wants to change the world, and that's a wonderful way to look at them my greatest feeling is that when i change the way a student thinks a little bit when you see that light go off mm. and you realize that they've moved to a different place and it's even greater to me when they discover hey i can use this camera to say something you know i try to pound it into them it's really going to give you a voice but you have to work at doing it you have to make the effort. And then you get those students that go there. I mean, you know, we publish student work when it's good, and I'm the first to advocate that here's where it needs to start. So, you know, it, you know, when I get a student that's doing some stuff that I get excited, I really feel like, you know, we have made a difference because they won't just influence their friends as they continue to go through their life and their career. Every time they do something, it's going to have an effect that keeps growing out like that. You know, that puddle wave that goes Ripple. further yeah. and further and further. Mm. So that's the hope, you know. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I can only do what I can do, <laughs> you know. So if I can change one person, it's great. I mean, think of it. You and I have both been magazine photographers long before we came here. Often you do a story and you never knew what the reaction was because people would see it in their home and you never saw what the reaction is. Mm. I mean, one of the things I see at the university and even people who are coming to us, like if they see something we've done and they respond, I'm seeing that, oh my God, did this, this had impact and, 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 and I've touched someone and that's important. I'd rather ask them to ask more questions than answers. 
like, you know, even when I'm doing an interview, you know, or even when I'm talking with a student, you learn more about an individual by the questions they ask rather than the answers they <laughs> give. Because the questions they ask tell you how they're thinking. Mm. The answers could be, you know, whatever they want it to be, mm. you know. So that's kind of how I guess I see it. Well, you've this is a fabulous project you've built. Um, I, I wish we had more time to to delve into it a little bit more, but we will, you know, we have seen a couple of clips and um, maybe we can do it again and talk more about your career arc and so on. So I think that's kind of interesting too. That would be fun and enjoyable. I'd love to do that. Thanks for coming in. Okay. Appreciate it. Uh Great to be here. Thanks for tuning in. Join us next time for another edition of Zeiss Full Exposure. If you can't watch, you can always catch the audio-only version on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Zeiss underscore Full Exposure or on the web at ZeissFullExposure.com. And to learn more about the latest in Zeiss lenses, head to Zeiss.com.